Hey, you're listening to episode 207, where we're chatting about mental health and all the aspects that may affect it. Our episode is being taken over by my friend Autumn Fladmo Smith, who is the co-founder of Paleo Valley and Wild Pastures, holds a master's in holistic nutrition, a certified eating psychology coach, and a certified FDN practitioner. Her passion for health began with her own struggles with IBS and anxiety. Despite a career as a professional dancer and celebrity fitness trainer, Autumn's own health was in shambles. Desperate for a cure, she and her husband, Chad, has stumbled upon the paleo diet in 2011 and within a month of beginning it her health was completely transformed autumn then made it her mission to share the information she had learned with as many people as possible she is a co-founder of paleo valley an organic whole food supplement and paleo snack food company that prioritizes nutrient density and food quality and they've sponsored the show and been a huge part of my life over the i don't know the last five years in 2018 she took a step further and launched her second business with her husband, Wild Pastures, a regenerative pasture-based meat delivery service. Wild Pastures makes supporting sustainable agriculture and local small farms easy for consumers. She lives in Boulder, Colorado with her husband and their son, Maverick. Autumn's so great. I can't wait for you to listen to this episode. Now, if you have questions about today's content, you can go to healthfulpursuit.com slash contact and ask me. You can also catch up on previous podcast episodes, including the notes from today's show. And there are a lot of them by going to ketodietpodcast.com. Just look for episode 207. Now, Autumn talks a lot about inflammation in today's episode. If you want to learn more about inflammation, in episode 200 of the podcast, my friend Dr. Will Cole was chatting about the inflammation spectrum. So if you want to learn more about inflammation, head back over to episode 200 and listen to that. Now, today's episode covers all the physical health aspects of mental health, and it's amazing. If you're looking for more and the physical aspect has hasn't been helping, I highly recommend checking out my self-expression workshop. You can find that by going to healthfulpursuit.com slash workshop one. Okay, let's do this thing. Hey, I'm Leanne Vogel, and you're listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. I've put together a free 21-page guide on achieving weight loss on your keto diet if nothing is working. Grab your free guide at ketoforwomen.com to get the steps you need to overcome the hurdles standing in your way. Thanks so much for listening and let's get started with the show. Hi everyone, Autumn Smith here. I'm a mom and a co-founder of Paleo Valley, a holistic nutritionist, eating psychology coach, and an FDN practitioner, a former fitness trainer, a yoga teacher. Basically, I am a lover of all things wellness. I'm also a part-time keto lady. I cycle in and out a few times a year because of some of the genes I have, which we're going to get into, but also just because since I found it, it, it makes me feel awesome. Now, Leanne asked me to come chat with you all, and I could not be more honored to be here when she asked me to choose a topic it was actually pretty easy because the intersection between diet and mental health is basically my favorite thing to talk about ever. And I've done a lot of research and have a lot of personal experience around the topic. Like I said, basically, I love this topic because changing my diet changed my life. I struggled as a teen. Ooh, did I struggle big time. I had anxiety, depression, an eating disorder, digestive issues, that no doctor or psychiatrist had the answer for. My anxiety was out of control. And because I didn't know what to do about it, I smoked, I drank, I used drugs. My behavior was so out of control that I was actually kicked out of my parents' house before I even graduated high school. Now, in hindsight, this is something I'm very grateful for. My parents and I have an amazing relationship today. But as a teen, after all of these trials, I came to the realization that no one could fix me that no one had anything to offer me, that there was something wrong with me. The antidepressants I was on made me feel like a zombie. And basically, I learned to feel powerless and really, really hopeless around my health, which is why when things changed for the better, 
I'm going to tell you how I did it. It really, really lit a fire in me to get out there and spread the word about the healing power of food and finding your perfect diet. Now, this hopeless, powerless, substance abusing girl that I had become who believed she was just going to have to manage the rest of her life was transformed back into a confident and content and energetic and inspired girl that I used to be before my teens hit. And it was magical and I was forever inspired. Now, at the time, People thought I was a little crazy because I was working a dream job as a personal trainer for the Tracy Anderson Method. If you don't know who Tracy Anderson is, do yourself a favor and check her out. She is a genius. I'm going to put a link to her website in the show notes. They call her the organic plastic surgeon because her method that she's created literally balances bodies in a really, really beautiful way. In fact, I had just gotten off of tour with Jennifer Lopez. Tracy Anderson sent me And even though I looked really fit, the truth is my body looked great or what most people would consider great today, but I was not well. I was breaking out with cystic acne like crazy, having to wear tons of makeup, reapply it before every single workout. My digestive issues were so bad that I looked pregnant after dinner and my anxiety and depression at times were a really heavy burden for my new marriage. So when my dear husband Chaz did a little research online. He went to Dr. Google and he found an article about how people could improve their digestive health through diet, which at the time was a really novel idea. I was reticent, but we adopted a paleo diet for 30 days and I slowly but surely started to experience what feeling well was like, both physically and mentally. So even though I love my job, I love Tracy Anderson, I quit my job and got a few nutrition related degrees. We co-founded Paleo Valley and the rest is history. So today I just want to share three of the tips and tricks I've learned along this journey to better mental health in the hopes that anyone out there suffering from anxiety or depression or other mental health related issues can find hope and feel empowered. But before we get to the juicy stuff, I just kind of want to set the stage a bit just so you can understand why, even beyond my personal experience, I am literally determined to help people understand this link between diet and mental health. A lot of this information comes from my master's thesis, and I swear I'm I'm not going to bore you to death with statistics, but I just want you to know if you're suffering from mental health issues, you are definitely not alone. This is, it's kind of an epidemic. So today we have about 40 million people suffering from anxiety. Depression is always at the top of one of the leading causes of disability, and a lot of times Mental health issues are treated with pharmaceuticals. For example, antidepressants are the number three most prescribed drug. 30 million Americans are taking them. And for some people, they work. I'm going to give them that. But for others, they have very, very real side effects. And according to Dr. Georgia Ede, SSRIs, which is a type of antidepressant, work for about 50% of the population. But what they don't often tell you is that's only 10% better than the placebo. Now, we've been taught by pharmaceutical companies that if you have a mental health issue, you have a quote unquote chemical imbalance that needs to be addressed. And well, That is sometimes true. The serotonin deficiency theory that most of us believe is responsible for depression, well, the evidence, it's it's just not as strong as many of us would like to believe. In fact, according to Dr. Kelly Brogan, not a single human trial has shown that depression is the result of a chemical imbalance. Now, I know that's probably shocking to read or to listen to, but if you'd like to learn more about it, please check out Dr. Kelly Brogan's awesome book. I'm linking to it in the show notes. There's also a really fascinating interview by Dr. Georgia Ede, and you'll be able to get that in the show notes too. Now, this matters to me because I was the teen who tried antidepressants like Paxil and Wellbutrin. I felt awful. I could barely keep my head off of my desk at school. I felt like a zombie. There was no emotion anymore. And I swear, my mind moved so slowly that I thought I had one thought an hour. And when I tried to come off these meds, it was like someone was zaps were going off in my brain. But what concerns me even more is the side effects of these meds for other people who experience more serious issues, especially on our children's developing brains. Benzodiazepines, for example, that are commonly prescribed for anxiety, 
they can be addictive in as little as four weeks. And one study has revealed that they actually perpetuate future addiction in kids. And I also learned from Dr. Brogan's book that five of the 10 most violence inducing drugs are antidepressants. In kids, there's also a documented increase in the risk of suicidal attempts, of aggression, and of homicide. Now, <laughs> What's just like, I can't even wrap my head around is that there's a pharmaceutical company, GlaxoSmithKline, was fined for targeting adolescents with their drugs, despite knowing about the fact that their drug increased the risk of suicidal attempts. And one of their drugs, Paxil, upon re-examination of one of their original trials demonstrating safety, was found to be far less safe and more dangerous than was initially reported. Now, um, again, I'm going to link to this story about Paxil in the show notes. This was the drug I took as a teen. And there's also a story in the show notes about a girl who killed herself just after two weeks on this drug, as well as the controversy surrounding its safety. So it's really, really terrifying for me as someone who used to take it as a mom and someone concerned with the future of the society and our children's generation. And especially in this era of school shootings and an increased risk of suicide, especially in our little girls, it makes me wonder how many of the kids and adults and people who commit these crimes are taking antidepressants. But I'm never going to say there's not a time and a place for antidepressants. For some people, I know they help. These people, they're in my family. And I, I'm grateful for their existence and people trying to come up with these solutions. Nor am I saying all you have to do is change your diet and poof, your mental health is going to be perfect. You're going to be rainbows and butterflies. I know as well as anyone that mental health is incredibly complex. What works for me won't always work for someone else. Mental health is a journey. It's a process. But what I am trying to say is that SSRIs and other pharmaceuticals used for mental health issues come with some pretty scary side effects. And many times, even when they do work, they're not actually addressing the root cause. So if we can find safe and side effect free diet and lifestyle intervention, use it as a baseline or even an adjunct therapy, I think that's a really great idea. My dream is that one day intervention, mental health intervention will be used as a baseline dietary intervention, like I said, or a foundation, or at the very least implemented alongside this pharmaceutical intervention, because food is truly one of the most powerful ways to influence our brain's chemistry, as we'll soon learn. And I think we're going to get there. There's some really awesome trials being conducted. Dr. Felice Jacka, she's one of the pioneers in this food and mood movement. And we're going to talk about it. I can't wait to share. But just let it be known that if you're one of the ones suffering, please know that there's hope that your struggles are not the result of the fact there's something wrong with you or that you have a pharmaceutical deficiency. They're often a sign of imbalance or inflammation or nutrient deficiency or a scream from your body for attention. And most importantly, there's often something you can do about it. Now, there's a powerful shift that happens, I think, when we realize that we don't always need someone else to fix us, that we shouldn't always give our power away to practitioners that know what's best for our bodies, because we need to learn to listen and observe and experiment. Basically, we can all just benefit from getting curious about our symptoms. So rather than feeling frustrated and powerless, which I know, I know it's a, it's a normal part of this process, but rather than getting stuck there, if we can learn to start asking why, what is this symptom here to teach me? What can I do? I know that my life changed dramatically when, when I was finally able to do that. Today's episode continues after this short message from one of my sponsors who make the show possible, plus give you some great deals on my favorite things. I don't think I can do the ketogenic diet because I love wine. This is the statement that so, so, so many women have told me. And my answer is always, but have you heard of Dry Farm Wines? They're the only wine club that offers zero sugar wines. This means that you can have a glass or two maybe three, and it won't affect your ketones. All of their wines are sourced from small sustainable farms. They're natural, organic, low in alcohol, have zero additives, zero carbs. And when you order by going to healthfulpursuit.com slash wine, you're going to get an extra bottle of wine for a penny in your first order. Again, that's healthfulpursuit.com slash wine. And if you're unsure of the link, simply check out today's show notes for all the details. So let's dig in. When there are, when I work with people, there are about three strategies and connections I like people to understand first. So let's get into it. 
Okay, on to the first thing I like people to know, that depression is a symptom, not a disease, and inflammation is often at its root. Now, when it comes to depression, diagnosis isn't cut and dry like in diseases like type 2 diabetes, where if your fasting blood sugar is over 126 milligrams per deciliter, then you've got type 2 diabetes, which might surprise some of you who believe that depression, like I used to, is a result of a serotonin deficiency or other some other super specific and well-documented chemical imbalance. But like I mentioned before, there has not been one single human trial definitively demonstrating that depression is the result of a chemical imbalance. It just isn't that simple. But what researchers are finding now is that mental health issues are often rooted in the immune system and should be categorized not as a brain-based disorder, but as an inflammatory condition like heart disease or cancer or dementia. And one of my favorite mental health quotes by Dr. Kelly Brogan reads, the best way to heal the brain is to heal the body within which it resides. In other words, the health of the brain and the rest of the body are inextricably linked. And when we take antidepressants for depression that target only the brain, it's kind of like taking an ibuprofen when you have glass in your foot rather than just removing the glass. It doesn't really make sense. And this is why I love dietary intervention so much for mental health issues because it allows people to cultivate both a healthy brain and a healthy body in a way that pharmaceuticals cannot, and it potentially gets to that root cause. Now, I'm not going to bore you with too many details about the research around how we know that inflammation and depression are linked, but I do think it's important to at least mention some of the cool research around the topic. Researchers have noticed higher levels of inflammation in the blood are associated with depression and that the levels mirror the severity of the depression, meaning more inflammation equals more severe depression. And this dose-dependent relationship or response as they call it, meaning that as the stress of inflammation increases, so does the depression, this gives the research a little more weight. We also know that we can induce depression by causing inflammation and that the use of an anti-inflammatory drugs can lower markers of inflammation like CRP and IL-6 and IL-1 and tumor necrosis factor, TNF, and can also cause the remission of depression. Pretty fascinating, right? So what is inflammation? Before we move on, I think it's important to differentiate between acute and chronic inflammation. Now, acute inflammation is the type when you fall and you skin your knee, like my cute little four-year-old Maverick did the other day. Now, this causes pain and redness and swelling. And this is actually a helpful process as long as it has an endpoint. But when we talk about the inflammation that lies at the root of most modern day disease, we're talking about chronic inflammation. And this happens when that acute response doesn't shut off. Now, symptoms of chronic inflammation include things like fatigue and fever and mouth sores and rashes and pain and just kind of other weird random symptoms. And as we're learning, mental health issues. And you can test for the level of inflammation in your body with tests like a high sensitivity C-reactive protein or HSCRP. Uh, Leanne might have covered this before, but I just thought it would be worth mentioning. And this all matters because food is a powerful way to reduce inflammation. We know 70, maybe 80% of our immune system actually lives in our gut. And we also know that the gut and the brain are in constant communication via something called the vagus nerve. Surprisingly, most of this communication goes from the gut to the brain. Many neurotransmitters are produced in the gut. Basically, we know there is a huge link now between the brain and the gut. And we also know that we can change the composition of our guts within days. And if you transfer the microbiome or the gut bacteria of a rat that has depression or schizophrenia or hypertension into a mouse that is germ-free, they're going to start exhibiting the symptoms of those disorders. So you can literally eat your way to better health physically and mentally and we can also eat our way out of an inflamed gut and inflammation and immune system, which also means an inflamed brain. So if you feel fine sometimes, and maybe then you're off or irritable at other times, or maybe you have long standing, seemingly random rashes, ear infections, a childhood history of eczema, asthma, or colic, daily mood swings, brain fog, maybe you're frequently cold, you're stuffy, you've got a runny nose, facial puffiness, or maybe circles, black circles under your eyes, or you're hyperactive, your child's hyperactive, aggressive, you have like crying spells. Now, these are all symptoms that you could be reacting to some of the foods that you're eating. 
that they could be causing inflammation. And it makes sense that chronic inflammation could be linked to what you're eating because we're constantly eating. And if you're eating foods that cause this inflammation every day, which, which a lot of us are, your poor immune system, it's never getting a break. And for many people, myself included, there aren't always the obvious inflammatory foods like potato chips and cookies, but sometimes they're healthy foods at times too. So I just want to cover the three tips for reducing your exposure to these inflammatory foods. So let's start with the low hanging fruit, shall we? Number one is just to eliminate commonly inflammatory foods. There's five I want to talk about processed foods, gluten, dairy, histamines, and artificial sweeteners. I know I'm probably not blowing anyone's hair back with this statement, <laughs> but highly refined processed foods, they're not good for our brains. In fact, according to research by Dr. Felice Jacka, an increased consumption of processed foods increases your risk for anxiety and depression by two times, even when you eat all the good stuff too. And even if you're keto most of the time, and then you have some cheat days that last weekend, like I used to do, I used to have be keto for five days and then kind of go crazy on the weekends. That still matters because those processed foods are literally detrimental to our brain and body. And, and this matters not only for our brains, but for the brains of our children too. There's other research by Dr. Felice Jacka, and, and this was actually re, um, re-demonstrated in another trial, but it showed that moms who eat processed foods when they're pregnant increase their child's risk of mental health issues like depression and anxiety, despite what the child eats after it's born or he or she is born. Crazy, right? And yes, I know you're likely not listening to this podcast if you're consuming the standard American diet or processed foods, and maybe you are, but I do see a lot of people in the keto space still relying heavily on processed foods or having these periods where they cycle in and out. So I just wanted to cover the basics. But the next food I want to talk about is gluten, okay? Gluten is a protein found in wheat and barley and rye, and wheat is honestly the one food I've seen cause the most problems for people when it comes to mental health. An interesting fact I want everyone to understand, you don't even have to have digestive symptoms in order to be sensitive to wheat. It can be strictly a neurological symptoms, like that it can, you can manifest that sensitivity just in your brain. It's linked to things like headaches and depression and anxiety, um, MS, and even ADHD. And way back in the 1950s, they noticed the link between gluten and schizophrenia. Now, there's a story about a woman. She was getting her PhD when she suddenly developed psychotic symptoms, and her condition worsened to the point that she actually made threats against her parents, her family. They eventually had to issue a restraining order against her. Fortunately, she was hospitalized, she was put on a gluten-free diet, and she had a full recovery. There's another story about a Portuguese woman in her 50s. She suddenly developed, again, these psychotic symptoms. She ran naked through the hospital ward she was in. She even tried to eat bird feces. And her symptoms completely went away, though, when she eliminated gluten. And they know it was gluten for sure because she didn't even herself believe that gluten could be that problematic for her. And so she would eat it again and then her behavior would worsen and her symptoms would continue to reappear. So it's a pretty crazy stories, but I'm going to link to them in the show notes again. Uh, they're definitely worth a read. Now, we also know that people with celiac disease, which is an autoimmune condition where people react to gluten, they have an increased risk of schizophrenia and depression and anxiety and bipolar. But it doesn't have to be just celiac disease. It can also be just a gluten sensitivity too. There's also evidence that for people who don't respond to anxiety meds, eliminating gluten can help. So why can gluten cause these issues? Now, according to work by Dr. Alessio Fasano, there's evidence that gluten damages the gut for everyone, everyone who consumes it. Whether or not you develop symptoms is just kind of based on your genetics. Now, we also know that gluten breaks down into morphine-like compounds that can stimulate the brain, and this causes really serious symptoms for some people. Now, these opioid compounds are often the reason people can't even imagine life without cookies or bread or muffins or these foods that are causing them the reactions because initially you feel really, really good. This was me in middle school. I remember we used to get these buns and the rest of our meal or pizza or a vegetable or milk, whatever. I would trade everyone, anything on my plate for a bun. I would often eat seven buns and eat them almost every day. And of course, we find out later, 
I'm very sensitive to gluten. So where do we find this? Where do we find gluten in the keto diet? You're probably thinking, well, I'm not consuming gluten. And maybe Leanne's taught you well on this subject, and I hope so. But I know some people find keto first and then paleo. And for some people, it's the other way around. And I just wanted to cover the bases and let you know that you can technically still be eating gluten on the keto diet, even if your carbs are low enough. And it can hide out in a lot of keto-friendly foods, soy sauce, salad dressings, frozen foods, coffee creamer, seasonings, gum, certain cheeses, broth, cold cuts, flavored teas, imitation seafood, ketchup, mayo, mustard, tomato sauces. And there's a lot of really sneaky names for it, like artificial color, caramel color, citric acid, white vinegar, natural juices, starch, hydrolyzed protein. I'm actually going to put a list, a more extensive list in the show notes, because it's pretty nuts. And if you're extremely sensitive to gluten, as some people are, even those who don't have celiac disease, like I said, that can be enough. Dr. Tom O'Brien, he's one of the world's experts on gluten. He tells a story about a nun who just could not get her gluten antibodies down. That means gluten antibodies are just evidence in her blood work that she was reacting to gluten, no matter how gluten-free she remained. And it wasn't until her doctor remembered that she was probably eating a communion wafer that had gluten in it every week. It wasn't until she eliminated that that she was able to fully recover. So gluten, 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 watch out for it. I know Leanne has likely mentioned this before, but I just wanted to say it again because there seems to be such a profound link for at least some people. I hope you're really enjoying today's episode. I'd love to see where you're listening from. Snap a pic and tag me at Healthful Pursuit or leave a review for the show on your favorite podcast player. It helps me out tremendously. Okay, back to the good stuff. Okay, my next food is dairy. So yeah, while our ability to tolerate dairy does vary, I will I can agree with that. There's emerging research that dairy, especially A1 dairy, can be at the root of certain mental health symptoms. Now, some of you might be thinking, what the heck is A1 dairy? So let me just break it down. A1 and A2 are different proteins found in cow's milk. Most cows produce milk with the A1 protein, Holsteins, for example, and this breaks down into those opioid morphine-like compounds, um, one of them specifically called BC7. Now, remember when I talked about that morph- morphine-like compound that happens after we eat wheat. Yes, like I'm saying, it's the same for dairy. And BC7 has been linked to inflammation in the small intestine and brain fog and poor thinking and sleep issues. And its role in mental health stuff is currently being evaluated in a trial by Dr. Felice Jacka. So I'll link to that upcoming research. Stay tuned for that. But Even before that, prior research has shown patients with casein antibodies. Now, this is, again, just evidence that your body is responding to this protein found in milk. They have a seven to eight times increased risk in the diagnosis of schizophrenia and a three to five times increased risk of bipolar disorder. And cow dairy seems to have the ability to also create folate antibodies. That's just vitamin B9, which we're going to learn in a little bit, is not a good thing at all. Now, while the jury is still out about the link between A1 dairy and mental health, I do know from my own experience, dairy just doesn't work for some people. My son can have it for about three days. We do super high quality versions, of course, but we have to back off after that. He gets mucus in his throat. Every time I eat dairy, goat cheese seems to be better, probably because it's an A2, um, but I get a runny nose. So... My recommendation is to you that if you're doing the keto thing and you still have mental health symptoms and you haven't yet excluded dairy, maybe think about trying it or at least look for the A2 milk yogurt. It's thought to be healthier, less inflammatory, and you can find it from Jersey cows in sheep's milk, goat's milk, those kinds of things. Okay, next on to veggie oils, rancid veggie oils. Okay, now this is a big one, keto friends, because I see these poor quality oils everywhere. Corn oil, safflower oil, soy oil, canola oil, these man-made oils that many Americans think are good for them are at the root of some major inflammation because they contain way too many omega-6 fatty acids. As as I'm sure you've heard by now, there's this balance we need to maintain between our omega-3 and omega-6 fats that we consume in our diet. So most Americans have way too many omega-6 given our huge consumption of these plant-based oils and not enough omega-3s. So please be very mindful of your consumption of these oils if you're not already. One, some symptoms that you might have this imbalance are things like an excessive thirst or just like chronic fatigue, dry or rough skin, dry hair, a loss of your hair or dandruff, PMS or breast pain, eczema, 
uh, dyslexia, learning issues, hyperactivity, and mental health issues like depression and manic depression and schizophrenia. So this could mean you have an essential fatty acid imbalance that could be helped by ditching the highly processed oils, sticking to natural fats from animals and fruits, coconut oil, extra virgin olive oil is incredible for the brain, avocado oil, tallow, lard, all from grass fed and finished animals. And know that this is one that you have to be extra vigilant about because you're going to even find canola oil and these low quality oils in your salad bar at Whole Foods and in so many healthy processed foods. It, it's really not even funny. So be, be very vigilant about the fats and oils you're consuming. Just a few others I want to throw out there. Artificial sweeteners can be inflammatory. I see them in keto products a lot, which is sad because I get so excited about keto products. And then if it contains an artificial sweetener, Splenda aspartame, it can negatively impact your blood sugar, your microbiome. And so I just don't touch them at all. And last but not least, I also want to mention food quality, poor quality animal products and GMOs that you're going to find in conventionally raised produce contain traces of pesticides and antibiotics. These can also alter our microbiome, cause inflammation. GMOs have been found to negatively affect our microbiome and the immune system. They interfere with vitamin D activation. So please do what you can to avoid inorganic produce and conventionally raised animal products wherever, whenever you can. And I know high quality animal products can be really hard to find. We actually just founded a company called Wild Pastures to address this. We take the highest quality animal products, grass fed and finished, of course, and pastured poultry and pork from these farmers utilizing rotational grazing practices. And we deliver them to people's door at wholesale prices just because it's that important for us to make these accessible, not only for the health of us, but also when farmers use these rotational grazing practices, it can restore the nutrient levels in our soil, which have been on the decline for a while. It sequesters carbon. There are just so many benefits too. So, okay. Now that we've covered some commonly inflammatory foods for the keto dieters, let's talk about other healthful foods that might be provoking your immune system. Now this includes number two is just foods you're sensitive to. So gluten and dairy and veggie oils and artificial sweeteners, processed foods, these are the big ones. And we know they cause inflammation for most people, but they're definitely not the only ones. In fact, even healthy foods can cause inflammation for some people due to the fact that their gut is leaky or there's these foods your body just doesn't like them. Now, this is what happened to me. I was doing all of the right things. I was juicing garlic every day and all these veggies only to have my skin break out like crazy. I was miserable. My husband, I remember him finding me crying in the bathtub about how terrible my skin looked in my 30s. And at times I didn't want to go out and meet people. It was a really tumultuous time. But Luckily, through food sensitivity testing, I found out I have a garlic sensitivity. I eliminated it mostly, and my breakouts now are few and far between. So was this affecting my mental health too? Probably, definitely, just because it was so stressful, I was breaking out, and it was also causing inflammation. So when I work with people today, I don't often have them start with food sensitivity because the root issue is often gut health rather than the food, meaning that once you clean up your gut health by eliminating commonly inflammatory foods and implementing other gut healing strategies, strategies, things get better, but I still wanted to put it on your radar because it was helpful for me. Now, other healthful foods you might be surprised to hear I've seen cause inflammation in people are things like eggs, nuts, seeds, shellfish, olive oil, even turmeric. So histamines can also be a big issue for people. Histamines are neurotransmitters or chemicals in the immune system. They're like bouncers. They help us get rid of things our body doesn't like, but they can also be found in foods and has been they've been linked in research to multiple sclerosis, autism, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, depression, schizophrenia, and more. So I just want to put histamines on the radar. I've seen a lot of people doing the keto thing who are eating a lot of histamines. Migraines are a big thing there too. So if you're doing all the right things and you still have these gnarly symptoms or unstable moods, or you have this inability to concentrate, this, this could be why. And you want to keep a journal and find these foods that are irritating you most or do the gut testing to be sure you don't have bacterial imbalances, a leaky gut, parasites, or candida lingering in your gut, which can also be very, very inflammatory. My favorite gut test these days is the GI map. I do think it's the most advanced testing out there, so it might be something to look into. Okay, number three, the fun part. We're getting to the last part, and that's how do we add anti-inflammatory foods? Now, 
this, I like to end with this point because we as human beings, we like to add things to our diet more than take them away. So let's do that. What keto foods can we use to reduce this inflammation? My first is curcumin, turmeric, organic turmeric and other spices. Saffron has a lot of evidence around it for your mental health and uh, Ceylon cinnamon, these organic spices have done wonders for people that I work with. We have a tumor complex. Um, we also put spices in a lot of our other mixes just because, again, of these amazing abilities for them to decrease inflammation. Turmeric specifically, highly, highly anti-inflammatory. Also, wild fish, really great. Teas, especially organic herbal tea. I love it. Organic dark chocolate, one of my favorite things. And fermented foods. Now, a study with those with manic depression, one group got a placebo and one group got probiotics. And those who got the placebo were back in the inpatient treatment, back in the hospital more quickly than those who don't. So we also know fermented foods have an anti-inflammatory effect. They encourage the production of these gut bugs that we associate with positive mental health. And they also produce GABA, which is this calming neurotransmitter that I think a lot of us <laughs> could benefit from some more of. So fermented foods, sauerkraut, our grass-fed beef sticks actually contain probiotics. I love this company, Coco Yo-Yo, I think they're called. They have a really clean like coconut yogurt that I am always consuming. And the last one is just veggies. So your leafy greens. I know Leanne says it, don't count your kale. I couldn't agree more. Leafy greens, kale, broccoli, organic, the works, all your leafy greens. Now there's a study at Chicago's Rush University Medical Center and those who ate one to two servings of leafy greens a day had brains that looked 11 years younger. That's really crazy. And they're also important because fiber is an important nutrient that some keto folks are missing out on. I know that there's debate around this right now, but Dr. Felice Jacka is doing a, some research on the keto diet, which is typically pretty low in fiber and whether or not it negatively impacts the microbiome. So stay tuned. But then if you're using the therapeutic or keto diet therapeutically, it might not always be the best for you. But in general, for most people, daily green shake or a salad, organ meats, fish, spices, herbal teas, those are my non-negotiables. So also make sure when you're eating, Leanne provides the best recipes. So pr make sure that you're loving what you're eating. If you're hating life and just force feeding yourself because they're keto, these keto foods, just stop because even emotional stress and the kind like, I don't want to eat this, but I'm doing it anyway, kind of stress that's, that can be inflammatory too. So take your time, find truly delicious keto foods that you actually look forward to eating. And just my last note in this section is I know you're picking up on the message that food is super powerful, obviously, but when it comes to inflammation, sometimes it's necessary to even go beyond food. Today, there are over 80,000 synthetic chemicals in circulation, most of which have never been tested for safety, definitely not tested for safety in the combinations we're using them in today. So please be sure you take a really hard look at the household products, your personal care products. I like to clean my countertops with just like vinegar and water and some essential oils, also using non toxic skincare products. If you go to the environmental working groups, skin deep database, you can just look at your product. And when you run out of it and find a less toxic version, they rate them all. Also get rid of plastics in your house and perfumes. We have some like beeswax wraps that you can put over your glass containers. Those are pretty cool. Instead of perfume, I use essential oils and your laundry detergents too. So don't be overwhelmed. Don't think you need to replace everything immediately. Like I said, when you run out of one, just kind of like come to resources like the Environmental Working Groups database, choose a high quality version. Today's episode continues after this short message from one of my sponsors who make the show possible, plus give you some great deals on my favorite things. ButcherBox features 100% grass-fed and finished heritage-bred pork and organic free-range chicken. ButcherBox sends you high-quality, health-promoting meats directly to your door on dry ice and free shipping anywhere in the lower 48. ButcherBox makes committing to quality protein sources less expensive and more available to everyone. Their prices are hard to beat, and it's challenging to find a higher quality product anywhere in the USA. I've been using ButcherBox for years and love the convenience of a package showing up just when I need it, and their ground sausage is an absolute dream. 
ButcherBox has put together a super special deal for all listeners of the show. Order your first box and get a special gift plus an additional $20 off. Now, this special gift is so epic that I can't even mention it on the episode today. So you'll have to go to butcherbox.com slash keto diet to check out the deal plus get your $20 off your very first order. Again, that's butcherbox.com slash keto diet to check out the deal plus get $20 off your first order. If you're unsure of the link, simply check out today's show notes for all the details. Okay, now that we know that mental health issues can be inflammatory in nature, let's get into the second thing I wish people knew about mental health. Okay, on to my second point is that nutrient deficiency can cause mental health issues. Now, according to the USDA, over 95% of us today are deficient in at least one nutrient. And in my personal experience, I think it's way more than that. And this is because our food supply is highly processed, like 60% of Americans are getting a lot of their foods from high, highly processed sources. Also, because our soils are depleted, today there's one estimate you have to eat about eight oranges to get the same nutritional equivalent from one that our grandparents ate. And most of us, unfortunately, have poor gut health, which means even when we make these healthy decisions, sometimes all the nutrients we're eating aren't being absorbed anyway. Now, our brain needs nutrients. It's not just a good idea to get them. When we don't get them, our brain just doesn't work. It breaks down. In fact, research has shown that nutrient deficiency can contribute to the onset of mental health issues like anxiety, depression, ADHD, and schizophrenia. It's really, really clear. So let me give you a powerful example of this. There was this 2003 case study describing a lifelong vegetarian. She was experiencing worsening depression, and eventually things snowballed. She began hearing voices. She was paranoid, and then eventually she became catatonic, which essentially means she was in a vegetative state. Now, her practitioners brought out all of the big guns, so to speak. She was given antipsychotics. She was given electroconvulsive therapy, and nothing worked. She didn't find relief. Thankfully, she was transferred to a new hospital and given vitamin B12 injections and had a full recovery over a period of a few weeks or months. So can you believe it? It's it's crazy that like simple nutrients like B12 that all of us have heard about, but maybe never paid that much attention to can make someone have debilitating symptoms. And it was hard for me to believe this at first too, but other research has confirmed that vitamin B12 is definitely, or deficiency of vitamin B12 is definitely an underlying cause of depression. One study showed that up to a third of depressed patients were low in B12 and that it compromised their response to antidepressants. So if you're feeling irritable and depressed and you have obsessive tendencies, vitamin B12 deficiency could be your issue. And this is especially true if you're a vegetarian or maybe you have gut dysfunction or low stomach acid. Many people do these days and you'll definitely want to have your levels tested. Something you must know if you've had your B12 levels tested and they come out fine is that psychiatric symptoms can manifest even before low levels are recognized. And also folic acid, which is a synthetic form of B9 supplementation can actually mask B12 deficiency. So even if your levels are normal, they could still not be optimal and problematic. So I like to recommend that everyone has their B12 levels tested. Most of the time you hear that anything over 150 is normal, but Dr. Kelly Brogan thinks they should be a lot higher around 600. And I'm going to put some resources in the show notes so you can get all the juicy details on some other levels you'll want to have tested in addition to your B12 to make sure that you are getting enough. Now, where do we get B12 from food? You're going to get it from things like grass-fed liver, clams, clams are huge, sardines and grass-fed beef. And you want to have them a few times a week. So you, you can't just have oysters once a month and call it good. So you want to be eating these foods regularly for best results. And just because most people are super surprised to hear this, grass-fed meat was actually shown to be the most anxiety and depression protective food studied by Dr. Felice Jacka. Yes, I said of all the foods studied. So Dr. Felice Jacka herself hypothesized that red meat would actually be detrimental for mental health when she was designing this experiment, but she found the exact opposite. So I just want to read you a little, a few quotes from her paper, because I think it really stood out to me. And it's something that a lot of people are missing. It said, when we looked 
looked at women consuming less than the recommended amount of red meat in the study, we found they were twice as likely to have a diagnosed depressive or anxiety disorder as those consuming the recommended amount. And then she continues, even when we look into account, we took into account the overall happiness of the woman or the healthiness of the woman's diet, as well as other factors like their socioeconomic status and their physical activity levels and smoking and weight and age. The relationship between low red meat intake and mental health remained. So that's pretty crazy, right? B12. That's what I'm saying. B12 is critical for mental health, grass-fed red meat, wild seafood, and organs. Get them into your diet as soon as possible. And if you're not eating or tasting organ meats, believe me, I get you. I've tried every which way to prepare them. It's just not working. It's not happening for me. That's why we created our grass-fed organ complex. And I know this might sound like a shameless plug, but believe me, it's really not because I work with people all the time who wouldn't be eating organ meats unless we created this product. So get it if you have to eat the organs if you can. If you can, I'm jealous and that's awesome. Okay, on to my next super nutrient for mental health. And this is actually my favorite nutrient, (laughs) which is super nerdy, but it's true. And that's vitamin C. Now, Vitamin C and mental health have this, like, I think underrated association. We know that the brain holds on to more vitamin C than literally any other organ in the body. We also know that vitamin C deficiency can result in neurological damage. But even more exciting, the flip side is also true. Enough vitamin C can reverse symptoms of bipolar disorder, anxiety, and depression. And a 2013 study at Vanderbilt University Medical Center revealed that this might be due to the fact that vitamin C impacts serotonin and dopamine levels. Another 2012 study showed the vitamin C supplementation was just as effective as the drug Prozac for combating stress and anxiety. So How, you might be asking, how does that work? Well, we're not exactly sure, but in the brain, vitamin C has powerful antioxidant effects, which is really, really important because we know that oxidative stress within the brain is linked to a host of brain-based diseases. Anti-inflammatory effects also help to interfere with excess glutamate production, which again is like a neurotransmitter imbalance linked to a lot of mental health issues. But these effects are found, these really protective effects of vitamin C are found in way larger doses than most of us are told to consume today. And that's the, that's the point I hope you remember. And I know many of you have likely read that vitamin C is needed in smaller amounts when you're not eating a lot of carbohydrates. And while that might be true, what's also true is that our needs for vitamin C vary widely. Okay. Some people need 20 times more vitamin C than others to get the full range of benefits. And if you have a toxic profession, maybe you're doing hair, maybe you're working construction, or maybe you're living in an area that's pretty polluted, or let's be honest, a lot of us are super stressed these days. These are times when more vitamin C will be very beneficial. It's also interesting to note that most other mammals can actually make their own vitamin C and they increase their production during times of stress. Sometimes I think in rats by a factor of three and in goats by a factor of 10. And like I said, I I don't know about you, but I feel like so many of us are under incredible amounts of stress and that this extra vitamin C can definitely be a buffer for our precious little brains. So in my personal experience, I think it's the most powerful and underrated nutrient and I just wish more people were talking about it. So when I started to take larger doses than I've been told to take before I immediately noticed this heightened sense of well-being and people I share this tip with all the time tell me the same thing, that they're feeling more cognitively flexible, that they have peace that they haven't felt before. Sometimes I even hear that their libido is coming back. And I also just read a fascinating review on the literature on vitamin C and mental health. The research around it is pretty impressive, even though you don't hear about it. So if you want to nerd out on that, I'm going to put the link in the show notes. But another caveat when it comes to vitamin C is that you don't want to just run out and get any old vitamin C supplement. The devil's always in the details. And most are made from GMO corn. In fact, 90% of the vitamin C on the market is made from GMO corn and processed with highly volatile acids. And you'll know this type because it's going to say ascorbic acid on the label. I prefer and I benefit most from whole food vitamin C. And I've seen people respond to whole food vitamin C in a way that they just don't to ascorbic acid. And I just recorded a fascinating podcast with a man named Morley Robbins about all the differences between this, the whole food 
food and ascorbic acid, it will be really surprising to you, I think. So I'm going to link to that in the show notes too. But here's the spoiler alert. Basically for serious diseases, heart disease, cancer, yes, ascorbic acid has benefits for sure, especially intravenously. Um, and it has its place. It has it works by a different mechanism, usually a pro-oxidant mechanism. But I do think for everyday preventative use, there are benefits to whole food vitamin C. So that's my whole spiel. And I hope it helps. I hope it's helpful for you. Actually, I, I just even read a study the other day, I want to mention that for some people, and I think this was mental health, they took a 1000 milligrams of vitamin C a day, and it was less helpful than 500 milligrams. So the dose matters, the form matters. And my last thing on that is, I really, really want you to take it in divided doses. It doesn't last long in the body, three, four, five hours, maybe. So what I do is I take it in the morning, I take it in the afternoon, and I take it in the evening. And if you're going to just get it from food, again, this is awesome. But contrary to popular belief, oranges are not the best sources. Things like bell peppers and kiwis, actually, and acerola cherry and camu camu berry and amla berry and something called the cockadoo plum, if you can get your hands on it. Those are nature's richest sources of vitamin C. And if you can't get your hands on those things and you want to just have something you can take really quickly and easily every day, then our essential C complex is a nice way to do that. If you do want to try the ascorbic acid route, I'm not mad at that. And I just ask that you try and find one that is not made from corn. I find a lot of people reacting negatively to corn. And so there is one, a brand called Sea Salt. I can link to that in the show notes too. Okay. Now a few other nutrient deficiencies that are just worth mention. I'm not going to go into detail here too much, but they actually did this study out of Columbia university where they rated the most mental health protective nutrients and foods. And so I want to just give you some of the standouts there. It was vitamin B9 folate, B6, B1, vitamins A, vitamin C, omega fatty acids, and then the minerals, magnesium, selenium, zinc, iron, and potassium. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of your food? That means at the top of your list for the most mental health protective foods, in addition to beef, (laughs) grass-fed red meat, mussels, clams, organ meats, and goat. And as for plants, because they did uh, animal-based products and the plants, you have leafy greens, lettuce, peppers, and cruciferous vegetables. When this is just why I have organ meats and a huge green shake every single day. I also throw in a little apple cider vinegar. Sometimes I dilute just like a capful and put it in some water, or I know people have various keto apple cider vinegar tonics, whatever you like to do, uh, just so that I'm ensuring that I'm breaking my protein down every single day. Okay, so that's the moral of the story in my section two. Eat your wild seafood, oysters, mussels, clams. Eat your organs, your heart, your liver, your kidney, and eat your greens several times a week. And if you're motivated and want to go all out and to kind of identify and really hone in on the nutrients that you might be missing, I love to send people to this app or website called Chronometer, C-R-O-N-O-M-E-T-E-R.com. All you got to do, it's like my fitness pal, but it has this really extensive micronutrient database. So it's going to show you vitamin A, B, iron, selenium, all the things. All you do is for three days, everything you put in your mouth, you record it in chronometer. Just be really meticulous, three to seven days. That's all I ask. And then it's going to show you where not only your macros or your carbs and your proteins and your fat, but also all of your micronutrients. And this has been extremely helpful because people have no idea oftentimes and you can't keep a running calculation in your head. It's just not possible. So this is really, really illuminating for a lot of people. And then what I also like to do, if you want to go one step beyond that, I have this nutrient deficiency quiz where you can kind of look at the symptoms. And if you look at the, what your micronutrient gaps are in chronometer, and then you also look at, well, what are the symptoms of this specific deficiency? You can get a pretty good idea of where, what you might be working with. Of course, there's blood testing too. Highly recommend that. And Dr. Chris Masterjohn has this nutritional cheat sheet that will rock your world. If you're going to go have blood work done and you want to get the ins and outs and how to kind of combat and correct these nutrient deficiencies, I highly recommend it. I'll put it in the show notes. So just to tie up this section with a nice big bow, rather than focusing on what you're not eating, 
uh, which I think a lot of us do, things like gluten and processed foods. I think it's also equally as important to make a concerted effort to eat the most nutrient dense foods you can find, and especially focus on a few key nutrients that seem particularly important for mental health issues like vitamin B9, B12, B6, vitamin C, omega-3 fatty acids, and magnesium. So my simple steps are just consume high quality organ meats, grass fed beef, and wild seafood regularly. Get those organic leafy greens number two in your diet on the daily. Just one to two servings can keep your brain younger. I call it my happy juice because when I drink leafy greens in a shake, it changes my world. (laughs) Number three, try higher doses of whole food vitamin C and see what happens. Of course, this is not medical advice. Make sure to run any and all recommendations I'm giving in this podcast to your practitioner or by your practitioner. And number four, track those micros in chronometer and take the quiz and see if there's any agreement there. Also, last quick tip, eating mindfully is one of the more more important things and more important strategies I've ever implemented with people. We waste so many nutrients simply because we're distracted when we're eating. They did a fascinating study where they had people just eat in a distracted state. They actually put on these headphones. They call it a dichotomous listening task. And they had one thing going on in one ear and the other in a different ear. I mean, highly stressful, obviously. But what they found out is that nutrient absorption can be completely shut down. Like 100% of your nutrients weren't absorbed in in this experiment. They've also done one where people are just watching movies. And of course, again, interfering with nutrient absorption in a profound way. So just you, let's, let's, if you're guilty of eating while you're driving, like I am, or while you're on the phone or while you're watching TV, let's just make a goal to practice this whole body mindful eating instead, just keep you and the food and, and your company, of course, if you love them, <laughs> never eat with people who annoy you unless they're your family and you can't avoid them. <laughs> I kid, but ideally you do want to eat when you're calm and focused and centered. And that's when magic happens in terms of nutrient absorption. Okay, and now to the last section. Number three is that blood sugar imbalance can often masquerade as mental health issues. Now, according to Dr. Patrick Holford and many other practitioners in my own experience, the most common underlying imbalance in many types of mental health issues is fluctuating blood sugar levels called hypoglycemia. Now, this blood sugar roller coaster occurs when people eat too many carbs. Yes, sometimes even your whole food carbohydrates, and this is more than your body can handle. This leads to a crash, which causes people to grab another high quality snack, which brings their blood sugar back up too high, and then another crash. And you can see this just becomes a really, really vicious cycle. I'm sure you've experienced it yourself. Even if it was in your pre-keto life, you had a high carb breakfast, then midday, you get hangry, irritable, maybe even shaky or what feels like anxiety. And that that's basically just your blood sugar taking a swan dive. And yeah, it does. It feels like a lot like anxiety and depression and moody, moodiness and all of these things. So get, I get it. My blood sugar was once a hot mess. I would come home at night and I would cry, like curl into a ball and just have a good cry. And I didn't even know why I was crying at the time. I was a newlywed. I was happier than ever. And once I learned to stabilize my blood sugar and watch my caffeine intake, which was a big piece of that puzzle, uh, I feel better than ever and more stable for sure. So all I'm trying to say is that your mood issues may have nothing to do with the circumstances of your life or your genes and everything to do with the food you're putting in your body. So other signs that maybe this is or has been an issue for you would be difficulty concentrating if you have blackouts, fainting or dizziness. I used to have those things. If you have excessive night sweats, or maybe even if you wake up in the middle of the night between like one and three, excessive thirst, chronic fatigue, you're feeling weak, you're forgetful, or you're drowsy, especially after meals. Also, like we've talked about, depression, constant mood swings, this hangry feeling, anxiety, irritability, or aggressiveness, and like uh, crying spells also. So the research is pretty clear that huge blood sugar spikes are not good for the brain. In fact, it's interesting to note that 60% of the sugar that you find in your blood is in your brain, the same level, 60% of the level. So we also know that high blood sugar is is literally predictive of depression in women. And probably because these blood sugar swings are actually depleting our neurotransmitters, they're creating inflammation, they're harming our hippocampus, which is an area in the brain that regulates our emotion and helps with memory. So 
It's a big deal. We also know that prolonged insulin resistance and reactive hypoglycemia, and these are the result of just kind of this constant chronic blood sugar up and down. When it's not addressed, this you know, frequently manifests as these psychiatric symptoms like depression and anxiety. And what's even crazier is that giving people with depression and bipolar and other mental health issues medications that help to make you more insulin sensitive, this improves your symptoms. So I have even heard Dr. Georgia Ede estimate that like 80 to 90% she estimates of all psychiatric issues could be resolved by just identifying these these dietary issues like unstable blood sugar and remedying them. Because you can imagine, now, when I work with people, I find that this is the simplest trick that leads to the most dramatic improvements. I also have a friend who swears they can control their bipolar disorder simply through you know, stabilizing the blood sugar. I'm definitely not saying that'll work for everyone, but I just think it's interesting and worth mention. And a slightly newish finding uh, regarding the devastating effects of this insulin resistant process or this prolonged blood sugar roller coaster is that 80% of those with Alzheimer's have insulin resistance. So we're not only working with mood issues, but also memory and cognitive impairment. Basically, too many carbs, too much sugar, it's toxic for the brain. And I know you're probably thinking right now, well, this is a keto podcast. We got that. We get it. We get the blood sugar stability thing. And I'm so glad you're ahead of the curve on this one. I just wanted to throw it out there because maybe you weren't always keto. Maybe you're listening and thinking of going keto. Or maybe you have prolonged history of these insulin resistant issues that you're dealing with and and that's why you came to keto. I just wanted to mention that stabilizing blood sugar is one of the first thing I always do with people with mood issues. So refined grains, dried fruits, fruit juice, ditch those immediately if you haven't already. And if you're a big coffee drinker, a tea drinker, uh, a booze drinker, if you like to have a lot of alcohol, these can also be negatively impacting your your blood sugar. So it's definitely, definitely something to consider. Okay. That's the end of my blood sugar rant. What I want to do just to tie things up is to talk about keto diet and the mental health research, where are we at? Um, And also end with a few lifestyle hacks that I put into play because food's not necessarily going to be the end of the road for everyone, even though it, it definitely helps. And most people I work with find a, a good amount of stability for sure. Okay. So As we all know, people are probably wondering, is it just stable blood sugar or is it keto? Does that have particularly helpful benefits? And so I want to talk about some of the research. Obviously, you've probably heard that the keto diet was originally adopted to treat people with epilepsy. So it's obviously beneficial for the brain or at least certain brains and especially those who are insulin resistant, like I I suspect. But the research is expanding that they're also finding useful for things like bipolar disorder, ALS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's chronic headaches, even multiple sclerosis. So super exciting research. And before we dive into it, if you guys don't know about Dr. Georgia Ede, Georgia Ede, please go follow her. She was a Harvard psychiatrist for seven years, and she discovered this profound connection between how she was eating and how her her brain health. And so she was implementing these in her practice at Harvard, but they kind of told her, we don't think psychiatrists have a place telling people what to eat. And so ever since, she's kind of been forging her own path. And the writing, the way that she breaks down the research is super effective, layperson-friendly, So definitely seek her out. I can put a link to her website in the show notes. Okay, but let's talk about some of the research because there was a recent review of the literature on keto and mental health. I'll link to that too. Now, I'm just going to go condition by condition because it's pretty interesting. So let's start with bipolar disorder. Now, this has always been a particular interest to me because my late aunt Candy suffered. So I was really encouraged to hear of a study of two women with bipolar 2 disorder who ate a keto diet, one for one year and one for three, and they found that the diet was superior to the medications that they were taking in the management of their symptoms. So I honestly believe I could be diagnosed with bipolar disorder if I had continued on the path I was on as a youngster. And I just wish that my aunt had gotten to implement it or try at least. And I know that this case study, it's not a randomized controlled trial, uh, but it's something. There was also another trial done too. Next, I want to talk about a mind-blowing case study in 2009 with this 70-year-old woman with chronic schizophrenia who was prescribed a diet, a keto diet, basically. She noted significant improvement in severe symptoms beginning only eight 
days after she did the keto diet, her diet was like beef and poultry and ham and green beans and tomatoes. And she reported a complete resolution of auditory and visual hallucinations that she had suffered from since the age of seven. That is incredible to me. I just couldn't believe it. And I know this is just a case study, but it's still so powerful. There's been a few other studies in schizophrenia, some in people taking medications, and all of them actually found benefits. So I cannot wait for more research around this topic. Now we're going to get to depression and anxiety. So there's not a ton of evidence here, but there were a few mouse studies revealing a keto diet can improve depressive symptoms and reduce the risk of mental health issues in the offspring. So that's cool. Kind of similar to the finding that Dr. Felice Jacka found. And for anxiety, there was a trial in rats that actually adding ketone supplements to a high-carb diet could reduce symptoms. Not super impressive, I know, but I'm excited for more research to be done here because my personal experience as an anxious person tells me that keto diet has a lot of, um, is very, very helpful. And Dr. Felice Jacka also just published the first randomized controlled trial looking at people with depression, even major depression and whether or not dietary intervention could work for them. And it actually found that it did. 30% of the cases, even major depression. Now, this wasn't a keto trial, but this is like the only randomized controlled intervention that has been done on diet and mood so far. It's called the SMILES trial. So I just wanted to mention that. And a quick aside too, bulimia. This was fascinating to me. Um, There's no trials, no formal trials around this yet, but Dr. Felice Jacka talks about how keto heals this condition beautifully in the people that she works with. She says there's no binging because there's no up and down blood sugar swings. So I just thought that was worth mention. Last but not least, I want to talk about Alzheimer's because it's not technically a mood disorder, but it is brain related. I have both genes for Alzheimer's, which means I have like 12 times the risk as people without these particular genes. So I just kind of want to cover this research because it's so exciting. This is exactly why I've been cycling in and out of keto for the past few years now, because I think it's not only for people with Alzheimer's, but I think it can be preventative. Now, Like the other disorders, there's not a lot of research here, but there is a case study and another study revealing the benefits of ketone supplements. And this is even in people with Alzheimer's, which I think is really important because I know that compliance, like getting somebody with Alzheimer's advanced stages to change their diet dramatically, if you don't have a caretaker willing to make all those changes, it can seem impossible. But I want to mention that ketone supplementation has been shown to help with symptoms, definitely something to look into. What we also know is 80% of Alzheimer's patients seem to be insulin resistant. So it's very likely a powerful root cause and again, can be remedied. There's a lot you can do with a low carb keto intervention. There's also a six week study that showed improvement in verbal memory for those with mild cognitive impairment. And I also want to put this awesome guy named Dr. Dale Bredesen on your radar if he isn't already. He's a researcher over at UCLA and he's doing a bunch of case studies and he's the first one to actually reverse Alzheimer's in clinical trials. And he has a number of interventions. It's not just the keto intervention, but it is part of it. And so I'm I'm really excited to keep watching what he's doing and I hope that you check him out. I recommend his book highly. It's called The End of Alzheimer's. I'll put the link in the show notes for you for sure. And please, like I said, know that this could be preventative. The scary thing we know about Alzheimer's is that it starts to develop before decades before your diagnosis. There's um, evidence that it starts in your 30s. Okay, so it's never too early to start protecting your precious brain. Okay, so basically preliminary research is really promising. Unfortunately, it's not clear whether it's lack of carbs, whether it's just low carb, or if it's the ketones or the reduction in insulin that is directly uh, responsible for all these positive effects. But I'd say it's a start nonetheless. So given all we've talked about, I just want to give you three key steps that I take um, to keep my mental health where it is today. And the first is just identifying the foods that are triggering your immune system, garlic, dairy, cane sugar, and gluten are the main ones for me. I've identified this through blood testing, but I also use this handy dandy little measurement called HRV. If you don't know what it is, it's heart rate variability. You can measure it across a lot of platforms. There's HRV for training. That's an app on your phone. 
There's also HRV Elite that has this awesome little sensor. You can do it on your aura ring. And it basically tells you how balanced or unbalanced your nervous system is, how well your overall body function is is going. And when it when my number goes down, I just know I'm gonna get sick. I've eaten something I shouldn't have. I've been pushing the pedal to the metal a little too hard. I didn't sleep well. But it's not always super specific, but over time, just being mindful of what you're eating and how you're living and where your scores are, it can really bring you some pretty awesome some clarity around whether or not your lifestyle is working for you, whether or not the changes you're making are in your favor. Okay. And and know that again, this is not just about food. I notice when I get my hair highlighted, <laughs> my number goes down for several days after. Okay. Second step is identify those nutrient deficiencies via chronometer and the quiz if you want to, and make sure you consume the most nutrient dense foods you can find on a daily basis. And then you're addressing any of those glaring micronutrient gaps. So heavy focus on leafy greens, organs, fermented foods, high quality animal products like seafood, anti-inflammatory spices like turmeric, and throwing in a little apple cider vinegar, and also eating mindfully big keys here. And the last thing is number three, keep your blood sugar stable or try the keto diet. I cycle in and out of ketosis a few times a year because I feel my best when I'm in keto up to a point. And then I often find sometimes that my HRV will plummet if I'm too low carb for too long. And that just tells me that I need to add my carbs back in. This is kind of what Leanne does with her carb ups. And so I really like the HRV for kind of cluing me into that fact. You can also just do it with how you feel if you're pretty good and be in touch there. Um, I've also done some testing to identify the carbs that best suit my body. And this is something I learned from Rob Wolf in his book, Wired to Eat. I can put a link in the show notes to his book, but basically you just test carbohydrates because everyone's response to different carbohydrates is different. And some people tolerate cookies better than bananas. And I tolerate bananas better than berries and kind of giving yourself that clarity can make you just dial things in for you, make your keto diet easier. Okay. And before I let you go, last thing, I just want to mention five of the lifestyle tweaks that I have really helped me achieve and maintain balance. Because I know we're going to start with food. It's so powerful, but it's not going to end there for everyone. And that's okay. So first is that I always just do daily stress reduction, like yoga, a lot of powerful research around it for anxiety and depression. Also, meditation is very helpful sitting with your back against the wall, box breathing, reading encouraging words, journaling, sitting in your sauna, just carving out a little time for stress reduction for you every single day. Modern life is stressful. And so we literally require those moments of downtime. Number two is just to prioritize sleep. Even one night of inadequate sleep leads to carb cravings and less insulin sensitivity, and which we know is just bad news for the body, bad news for the brain. Number three, get outside in the sun. First thing in the morning, if you can, light's going to positively impact your neurotransmitters levels, and it's also going to anchor your circadian rhythm and promote restful sleep. Number four, just know that a lot of us are going to have to unravel some of the conditioning that we have um, and the thought patterns and behavioral patterns that we picked up in our youth um, in order to feel our best long term. And and that's okay. I recommend following Dr. Nicole LaPera on Instagram. She's the holistic psychologist. And she has been one of my favorite finds this year. I also have a podcast I did with her. You can start with that really, really amazing stuff about unlearning and reparenting our sweet selves so that, you know, for maintaining mental health. And Katie Crosby over at Thriving Littles is one of my favorite people to follow in terms of how do we create this emotional intelligence and this sense of worth in our kids. So also really worth following her. Now, last thing, if you try all these things and you need more support, look into amino acid therapy, other natural remedies. It works, amino acids work pretty much immediately. They're relatively, I mean, they're very safe interventions. There's clinical trials behind it at something called SAMe. Also like a hundred different clinical trials showing its effectiveness. I'm going to link to some sources like Trudy Scott's a really great lady in the amino acid space, Julia Ross, and I'll link to a few others in the books. Okay. So summary for people who don't want to take meds, if you can't afford them or you haven't benefited from them, dietary change is a cheap, relatively easy, and incredibly promising intervention for mental health issues. And not only could help you avoid certain side effects, but you're also going to get some awesome side benefits because you're going to heal your brain and your body and potentially address the root cause. So that's it, my friends. Like I said before, I think food is the most powerful tool you have to impact your brain's biology 
And I hope that you take the steps to make that work for you. And I sincerely hope this has been helpful. Thanks so much for listening. Please reach out to me at any time if anything I've said made you upset or it made you happy. I love any and all feedback. You can reach out to me at support at paleovalley.com or autumn at paleovalley.com, either way. And you can also use the coupon code KETO20 if you want to try any and all of our Paleo Valley products. Again, thank you for listening. It's been such an honor to spend time with you. Wow, right? Autumn is just fabulous. Next up on the show on Sunday, November 24th, we have episode 208. Allie Miller is taking over talking about functional medicine and your keto, the role of inflammation on your ketones and your mood, microbiome reset and why you may not tolerate probiotics, the HPA access deep dive. Oh, it's so good. You're going to love it. The role of your stress on your hormones and metabolism, how fasting may be harmful for you and it's not helping, fueling the whole family, meals and snacks for toddlers, children, and how to navigate foods and so much more. Then Wednesday, November 27th, episode 209, I'm chatting about keto hair loss. So stay tuned for that, and I will see you in a couple of days. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. Join us again in a couple of days to discover more Keto for Women secrets for your fat-fueled life. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor should it be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representations or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.